In this video, we're going to continue on our series looking at how to design compression members using NZS3404, the uh, New Zealand steel standard. Um, previously, we've looked at how do we determine the section capacity of a member. And uh, if you recall, the section capacity of a member is going to be dictated uh, and controlled really by its um, ability to develop the full plastic section um, without local buckling. Um, now with a member compression, what we're looking at is uh, not a section anymore, so we're not looking at local buckling, but we're looking at global buckling of the whole section. So um, as we sort of continue on, what we're going to look at is really uh, how do we define uh, this governing equation here, this um, uh, N star has to be, uh, you know, this N star being our demand, uh, having to be less than phi times n sub c, and you can see n sub c is really just going to be the um, section uh, capacity, which we've already figured out, we've already learned how to determine that, uh, times this multiplier alpha c. And as I said, uh, we're really looking at the, um, uh, the capacity of the member to resist this global buckling phenomenon. So uh, this alpha c is really what's well, what we'll refer to as our member slenderness reduction factor. So it is um, essentially some modifier that we're going to put onto um, our section capacity, uh, which says that, well, we'll we will um, uh, reduce down that capacity uh, based upon uh, our ability to uh, resist buckling. Now, if uh, we we'll do a quick thought experiment, if we had a very, very short column, um, it's unlikely to buckle. So uh, we'll do that here with our, our little foam section here. So if I have a really, really short piece, um, do it like this, really short piece, well, it's not buckling. You can see maybe right there at the edge, but mostly what it's doing, here we'll do it this way where we've got a, maybe a little bit better light, um, mostly what it's doing is it's squashing. Now, if the more slender we go, and you can see we're we're fairly slender member here, uh, it wants to buckle. And so, um, a, you know, just as we think about this, uh, and and as we're we're going through the design, uh, really what we want to look at is, or uh, we want this alpha c uh, to be as close to one as possible. Because if it's as close to one as possible, uh, that means we can take uh, more advantage of our, um, our full section capacity. Um, in real members, it's unlikely to be that, uh, but this is, uh, this is sort of what we, we want to see. And again, uh, the longer that we get, the more slender that we get, um, the lower this alpha C is going to be and the lower our total compression capacity. So um, as you can see, this alpha C is going to be dependent upon uh, really these three things. Um, First one is the boundary conditions. So, and that's going to be um, our, you know, essentially our effective length. So if we look back to our uh, initial um, uh, lecture on uh, boundary conditions and Euler buckling, uh, you know, we showed that, you know, difference between our critical buckling load for pin pin versus, you know, fix fix versus uh, fix pinned um, showed a, a pretty significant difference in terms of our capacity. And so um, that's really what we're, you know, this uh, effective length factor, uh, case of E, is going to do for us. Um, it's going to help us, uh, you know, account for those different boundary conditions and the different capacities we can get uh, in global buckling. Uh, the other thing which is important is our residual stress pattern, um, uh, alpha B. Uh, so this alpha B factor is uh, really accounting for the fact that um, we have, uh, you know, as we manufacture steel sections, uh, you know, they are, are red hot either through a rolling practice or uh, when we uh, fuse metal together with, uh, with welded sections. And then as those cool, uh, the portions which are um, in, say, a, uh, we'll do a, a quick little sketch here. So for our residual stresses, now, remember, as they cool, the areas which are going to cool last are going to be 
here at the intersection between the uh, the webs and the flanges. And so uh, as those cool last, uh, they tend to uh, pull in the edges which have cooled sooner. And those uh, will then develop a compression uh, residual stress and will we'll reduce down um, the, the total uh, capacity. Now we looked at that really from, and this is really uh, brings it us back to the section uh, capacity and you know this um, you know residual stress factor was a was a big deal for compression um, but then uh, you know we can also have a similar thing uh, along the length of the element and so uh, we need to uh, account for that uh, the final aspect uh, which is really going to drive this alpha C factor is the slenderness ratio so this LE so our effective length uh, as you can see up here uh, divided by R, where R is the radius of gyration. And so this radius of gyration is really a measure of uh, how far out uh, the material of a given section is uh, from its center. And, and so it's, that tells about its uh, um, you know, ability to resist uh, you know, movement away from the center. And so in this case, movement away from the center is going to be buckling of the section. So um, keeping this in mind, this is what we're going to kind of go over in the lecture today, is really how uh, this alpha C uh, gets developed. Uh, we'll give a little bit of the background, and then in the coming videos, we'll do a, um, an example or two to hopefully make this uh, a little bit more concrete. So um, as I said, the, uh, the main contributing factor um, is going to be uh, this lambda n. So you can see this lambda n brings in these other sort of dependent factors which we said alpha c uh, was uh, dependent on. So this alpha n, uh, it has this uh, effective length, Le, it has a slenderness, and then it has this um, you know Kf factor, which we found uh, in our previous video on section capacity, uh, is really the uh, form factor for our um, uh, our, our uh, compression capacity of the section. So it is the um, uh, effective area over the net area. And as I said right here, it's just really what our um, likelihood is uh, to resist local buckling. So, um, and, and this is, a, again, it's a modified slenderness ratio because it's taking into account this. Uh, so the, the actual slenderness of the section would just be this. It'd be LE... Um, over R. But by putting in this uh, you know, form factor, Kf, and accounting for the difference of um, uh, our grades of steel, whether it's, you know, we're using a grade 300 or a grade 350 over what uh, these equations were developed for, which was a grade 250 um, steel, um, then we can modify this and really kind of take into account that uh, local buckling uh, in our slenderness factor. Um, before we go any further, let, I want to just do a brief discussion about effective length and how do we determine it in a real section or sort of in a, uh, in a, in a member which is, you know, maybe a little bit closer to reality. So, um, it, it's just going to be this effective length factor, Ke times L. Um, and then, so the first thing we should look at is what L do we use? Do we use the whole height of a column? Do we use the intersection? Do we use the clear distance? Well, if we go into um, NZS 3404, uh, you can see that the, uh, the length of the member uh, here is going to be uh, taken from the center to center of the intersection with restraints, or if it's a cantilever um, to the free, uh, free end. So going back here, you can see uh, the drawings that we have <clears throat> are really, so, you know, if we have a, a beam column joint, um, the length L that we're going to use in our calculation for our member compression capacity uh, will be the centerline uh, intersection. So you can see I have that drawn here. Uh, so it's going to be the centerline intersection uh, with this beam. Uh, for a cantilever, it's just to the free end. Um, so that's you know what we have here. And then for um, well, I have a, a a small little frame here where you can see uh, we've got you know two compression members, two columns here. So these will have 
uh, very likely very different uh, compression loads because the bottom one has to carry uh, the loads from the top. But you can see that um, our distance L uh, for the bottom one will be from our ground restraint uh, to the center line of this beam and that our, um, uh, our length that we use for our effective length calculation for the top column uh, it will be just the center line to center line distance between the beams. So that's the L that we use. What about this factor uh, KE? Where does this come in? And as you can see, it's, well, it's really going to be based upon our, um, our likelihood of, um, of if the member can deflect uh, sideways or not. And so, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, there's really two um, uh, different categories that the steel standard uh, uses, and here's what they are. So, we have um, whether we have a system which is braced against side sway, or whether we have one that is uh, able uh, to go against side sway. So, this is sort of the first, uh, and what you'll find here when we do these compression uh, calculations. There's a lot of sort of these uh, divergent paths where it's a sort of uh, you can if you're, you're used to programming, it's like an if statement. You know, if you do this, then do that. So the first thing we need to determine is you know for an individual um, element that we're uh, trying to determine its compression capacity. First, we need to see well what is that um, element? What what type of system is it sitting in? Whether it's this system which is braced against side sway or is able to, uh, to go over with side sway. Uh, the reason that we look at this is really for these uh, P delta effects, either P little delta or P big delta. Um, and we'll talk about more of these in an upcoming video uh, on second order effects. Um, but you know, this, this will drive um, even our, our simplified um, first order uh, compression. Um, uh, calculations. So if something is braced against side sway, it means that the top can't move laterally. Um, and so uh, I've drawn the deflected shape in red here. And so, you know, if we have uh, an element, say it's got a brace bay, even this element down here, because it's connected to um, a, a, a bay which is braced and nice and stiff and won't move sideways, well, we will only really get deformation um, uh, along the length of the member. So we have this sort of, you know, P little delta um, aspect. And, and if you, you know, go back to the, uh, the lecture on our, our introduction to, you know, buckling and Euler buckling, you know, we, we showed that, you know, this little bit of um, out of plane deformation uh, will uh, really reduce down what our total compression capacity is. And so we need to account for that. Um, so that's a brace system, and this is um, what, what we'll focus on to start with. A sway system um, doesn't have a uh, you know doesn't have a bay which you know, braces it against side sway, so it can move side to side. So uh, types of sway systems would be um, you know what I have drawn here, which would be like a moment resisting frame. Um, simple cantilevers are also a, a sway system because nothing stops this top from moving horizontally. And so we get a slightly different um, effect. We have the P, uh, what we call big delta, uh, where it's a, uh, what happens is there's a, an additional moment demand caused by this force and this eccentricity at the base. And so um, the effect of a sway system is that we, we really need to uh, either reduce down what our uh, capacity is uh, accounting for this additional moment, or we bump up the demand. Those are sort of the two different ways that we can do it. And if you think about it, um, you know, really, if we're, we're trying to solve this inequality here, either bumping up the demand or reducing down the capacity is going to do uh, kind of the same thing, right? And it's just um, two approaches to, to get to the same answer. Um, the last thing I want to talk about with sort of this effective length in the two systems is, so I've drawn a a frame system here because uh, that's the most common but you know you can have an element which might be say a uh, an ele a truss element <clears throat> which if you've got uh, more roof bracing um, you know you can brace a truss element against side sway uh, we don't necessarily have to be looking at uh, things in frames so um, that was 
uh, our brief overview of, you know, what type of systems do we look at? And that's because this um, case of E uh, is based on, you know, which of the two. So say we decide, you know, we, we choose which one it is. Um, so say we have a, a, a column element, say we're looking at this one, and it's an embrace system. Well, what's our next step? How do we determine case of E? Well, uh, like a lot of things in the steel standard, um, there's really two different ways to do it. The first way is, uh, so if we have an isolated column or if we're using idealized boundary conditions, uh, which is probably what we will start with um, for, for these examples, uh, well, then we go and we see this figure 4.8.3.2. So let's do that. Let's go over to the steel standard. Um, and let me just scroll up here. So this is figure 4.8.3.2. Uh, that you can see here. And from this, you can see that we have these different buckled shapes and we have some um, different effective length factors, case of E. So this is pretty straightforward. And you can see that we've got different ones for brace members uh, and for sway members. Uh, another thing that you can look at is that you can see that the case of E, uh, the effective length factor, which we multiply that length by, uh, for a brace member, it's all either less than or equal to one. And so that means that this is uh, you know, the, the effect of shortening our um, compression member, which means our slenderness goes down, which means that uh, we are less likely to buckle um, with this sort of pin-pin uh, being our default case, this pin-pin brace member being our default case. You know, this should look familiar. This looks sort of like our um, how we derived our Euler buckling. Um, and so, all right, that makes sense. Then if we look at our sway members, well, they are all greater than one. Um, and that is gives us the effect of increasing our effective length because it's just KE times the length of the member. Well, a member with a longer length uh, is more, for with the same cross section, is more slender. Because if that slenderness is just L over R. And so more slender members have a lower capacity uh, to resist buckling. And so uh, that goes back to the, uh, essentially we're decreasing our capacity uh, based upon our uh, slenderness. So um, if we're working with idealized boundary conditions, uh, what we do is we determine if we're a braced or a sway system. Uh, then we come to this figure and we look, well, do we have a uh, system which is pin-pin? Is it fix-fixed? Is it uh, pin-fixed uh, for you know either of these two systems? Um, and then the other way is that, you know, sometimes we aren't working with just isolated columns. Sometimes we want to uh, deal with uh, how do we work with, you know, columns in a frame. Um, so, for example, you know, if we have a braced frame or we have a sway frame. Well, um, the standard gives us a, another way to uh, contend with that. So uh, we can go through and we can determine really what our stiffness is at the joints. <clears throat> and I've got, um, and this is really just a, a summation of, you know, what all of the column stiffnesses are coming in uh, to a particular joint and what the beam stiffness is coming into a joint. And we're, we're summing all of those up uh, for a given plane. And uh, this gamma factors, really, you can think about it either as a stiffness of the joint or probably what's more correct is a, is a total rotation. Um, just a few points down here. Uh, the standard uses for, if we have a pin connection, it uses a gamma of 10. And if we have a fixed, it uses a gamma of 0 0.6. And that's just because, you know, um, we, we won't have uh, true pins and we won't have true fixity uh, in real structure. So if we look at this element here, um, if we were to work with um, a uh, idealized system, well, this one's actually probably closer to... Um, a, uh, a fixed fix, uh, a pinned fix, so pin and pin, um, but, and then over here, uh, an idealized, we probably have a, uh, a fixed fixed, it's top and bottom, and so that fixed fix, here we'd have a gamma at both ends of 0 0.6, 0 0.6, here we'd have either a gamma of um, 10 and 10, if we're going to model it as pin pin, um, or it would be uh, 10 and 0 0.6 if it's pin and fixed. Um, 
that's if we use idealized conditions and um, if we uh, if we want to go through and then determine, you know, based upon the stiffness, say, uh, say we'll, we'll use our sway frame over here, uh, you know, at this joint, we would find out, you know, what is the summation of the um, the moment of inertia divided by the length of the col of column one and column two, and we'd sum those up. And then we'd find out, well, what is this uh, beta E times the moment of inertia of the beam uh, times L. And this beta E factor is really just, you know, what is the far end of this, uh, this beam doing? Is it fixed? Is it pinned? And we can see that in the, uh, the table uh, 4.8.3.4. So if we come through here, um, uh, let's see if we can find that table for it, three to four. So here's our, how do we do our stiffness ratio in rectangular frames? And you can see, um, you know, if the far end is pinned, uh, our beta E factor is 1.5 for a brace system and 0 0.5 for a sway system. So this table is fairly straightforward. Well, once we've determined all of those gamma factors, um, you know, gamma here from you know, 4.8.3.4.1, well, then we want to go through and use one of two um, figures in the table. And so we have one for sway members and we have one for brace members. So let's look at the one for the brace members. And this is how we determine our effective length. So what we do is we find our, um, uh, our gamma at one end and our gamma um, at the other end. And so let's say let's use a, a gamma of 10 and a gamma of 10. And we come up and come up. And so we have an effective length um, somewhere above 0 0.95. Um, let's try you pick up a, another one, which might be uh, interesting. So let's look at a gamma of uh, maybe 0 0.6 and of 10. So go 0 0.6 at one end, 10 at the other. Um, so we're somewhere between 0 0.8 and 0 0.85 now, and then that's, that's how we get our effective length. So it's, it's fairly uh, straightforward and obviously we're using uh, this for our brace members and this for our sway members. Now, uh, one sort of last point of interest is that if we go back to our, um, our, <clears throat> our figure here for idealized constraints, you know, these will look very similar to our Euler buckling equation, our Euler buckling equations, except the effective length is a little bit off. So for uh, fixed fixed, our effective length factor is 0 0.5. Um, it's about 0 0.7 for pin fix. It's about two for our sway members. Well, what this is, is this is just using, instead of uh, a full fix and a full fix, it's using this gamma of 0 0.6 and 0 0.6, and that's why we're getting this effective length factor of 0 0.7, just really coming straight out of here. So if we look uh, 0 0.7, so if we go 0 0.6 to 0 0.6, we're somewhere between 0 0.7 and 0 0.75. So, and, you know, it's not exact, but that, that's really where these, these numbers are coming from. And it's, it's really just the way for um, the standard to incorporate some more realistic uh, rotations uh, into the um, overall um, standard. So um, that, that's enough of that for now, which I, it will become more clear as we go through and do some, uh, some examples. But, you know, so we, we've just to sort of recap and, and get us back on track here, we're, again, all we're trying to find is this alpha C, and we, we really want to see what it's dependent upon. And so we've talked about this boundary conditions, uh, slenderness ratio. So we, we've really ticked off these two bits um, here where, you know, slenderness ratio R is just going to be dependent for your uh, whatever section we are analyzing or, or choosing in our design. Uh, we figured out how to determine uh, K, E, and L. So now let's look at this uh, residual stress pattern and this uh, lambda N. I said this was the main contributor. So let's look at that in a bit more detail uh, and, and get back to sort of alpha C after our little uh, deviation uh, into effective lengths. So alpha C uh, equals all of this. Um, it's actually a rather, uh, rather large 
uh, equation here, and it's kind of a kind of a mess if you if you see it. It's uh, you know it's this cosi times one minus the square root of one minus ninety over cosi lambda squared. You can see cosi is the same, you know, basically this inverse, uh, and everything is sort of pulled back into itself. So this lambda is just the slenderness of the section. So without any slender, without any uh, ke factor, uh, lambda n is uh, what we showed previously, uh, which is this modified slenderness ratio. Um, we come all down. We've got this alpha a, alpha b, alpha a equals this thing. Alpha b is in a table. And then I say, well, this is this is a mess. So you know, in fact, let's that's even worth writing. You know, that's you know hard to deal with. So all of this really hard to use, you know. Good for a computer. bad for an engineer. So, you know, what what do we do? Instead of going through these, and if you think about, like, if we were to design something, design is iterative. We don't want to have to run through all of these equations every time. That That's really, really uh, a big headache. So instead, um, what is often done is these values uh, for different um, slenderness and different alpha b's are all tabulated into this alpha c equation, uh, into these alpha c tables. So again, let's go back to the standard. And you can see uh, these you know, big ugly equations uh, in, for alpha c. Um, but this alpha b is going to be the first thing we look at. And it's... Um, this member section constant. So if we come here, it's just in this table here. This is our alpha B table, is table 3.3.1. Um, you can see there's our alpha B. And let's see, well, you know, let's have a quick look at this and see, well, what does it seem to be made up of? Well, if we go through, we determine, you know, our section type, whether it's hot rolled or cold formed or welded. And we look at a, so this is really, uh, makes us think about, you know, alpha B has to be dependent upon uh, residual stresses. And then our KF factor is really whether it's going to have local buckling or not. So I'm like, all right, that's um, that's kind of sensible. That's probably, let's go back and, and write that down. So, you know, alpha B is our residual stress pattern. And, um, you know, whether local buckling will occur. And that's our, uh, from our form factor, case of F. Um, and so going back, so we can see, you know, we, we can determine these two things pretty easily. So we, we know what type of section we're going to pick up. Um, we know we've already determined our form factor when we looked at our section capacity. Uh, so the next thing we want to find is this alpha C. And if we go just to the next table in the standard, 3.3.2, uh, you can see our alpha C factor is going to be dependent upon this lambda N and this alpha B. And um, this lambda N is just a uh, you know, fairly straightforward equation. Um, as you can see here, we we can determine our effective length. We can determine R. We already know these two things. So this is just our modified slenderness ratio um, for for a given section. And then uh, we look well. We can define our modified slenderness ratio. We can grab our alpha B from our um, our previous table up here. And then we can go through and find out, well, you know, what is our alpha C? What's our, our reduction? As you can see, where we've got very small slenderness ratios, it really doesn't matter what our um, alpha B is. We're, we're going to be have an alpha C of 1, which basically means that, that makes sense. For very small slenderness, 
uh, we're going to be very close to the section capacity. And, you know, as I said here, for very small slenderness, alpha C tends towards 1. So N sub C tends towards the, um, the section capacity N of S. As our slenderness ratios go up, you can see our alpha C, basically the factor that we're putting onto our alpha C, the, the factor we're putting onto our uh, section capacity goes down. So down to where we're, we're looking at, you know, we can get very slender here and we're looking at, you know, uh, less than 10% of the section capacity. Um, and so that's a, uh, that's a, that's a pretty big deal there. Yeah, so I mean that that's uh, that's quite a big deal. So the um, kind of the last thing we want to look at is uh, you know we've we've seen that uh, this alpha B and alpha C in tables. I just want to show you a, a quick graph um, as to sort of what this means. And um, so on the uh, on the x-axis is the modified slenderness ratio, which uh, you know we've we've shown you um, you know just uh, that's that's this one right here and then on the um, on the y-axis here we have our ratio of n's of c over n's of s which is really uh, we can read this as our uh, alpha c so again going back to our equation if we just moved n's of s over here alpha c that's the ratio n's of c over n's of s um, and with this equation what we find is that you know if you plot up um, you know, what's in those two tables for our alpha B and our alpha, uh, and we wanted to compute our alpha C, you can see that as our slenderness ratio goes up, uh, we have this actually quite steep drop off in our, um, uh, in our alpha C, in our alpha C capacity. And you can see that it's going to be heavily dependent upon, you know, what our residual stresses are, where, um, you know, an alpha B equal to uh, oh, sorry, an alpha B equal to negative um, 0 0.1 um, is going to be, you know, a, a lower residual stress, and that's our, uh, we're far more likely to uh, get a, a greater section capacity out of our, um, our, our chosen section, while uh, an alpha B uh, equal to 1 uh, means that there's, you know, very likely a lot more residual stress built in here. So these tend to be um, welded sections with really thick flanges where there, there's uh, there's lots of stress uh, that gets built up uh, because there's a lot of heat and a lot of differential cooling. Well, then you can see for, for the same slenderness ratio, um, we're going to end up with, um, so say we look at a slenderness of 50. Uh, so if we come up here, so for one, uh, we can take about, you know, maybe 70-75% uh, of our capacity. Um, but then if we go to where we've got uh, much smaller residual stresses uh, and this alpha B equal negative one, uh, you can see that we're up to almost almost 100%. So maybe about, you know, 0.995, so maybe about 95% of our capacity. Um, so I, we're, we're just going to kind of wrap up there. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully you can see that, you know, that's while there's a, a lot of tables and a lot of uh, things to go through, really uh, the main factor when we're determining these compression capacities is the, um, we're going to use this lambda n, uh, we're going to determine what our effective length are, uh, you know, what our effective length is, and then we will use this uh, alpha b to determine our uh, compression capacity so that we can then um, go back and uh, determine, you know, where do we sit uh, within, um, whoa, I've lost you here, uh, during the wrap up, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll sort of scroll through here, there we go, sorry about that. But yeah, once we have our lambda n, uh, we can determine our lambda c uh, based upon this alpha b and these, um, uh, just from these tabulated uh, results um, uh, for lambda c, which which uh, define those curves I just showed. So uh, we'll we'll wrap that this lecture up there, and uh, we'll we'll move on to doing some examples, which should um, make this all sort of uh, seem a little bit uh, clearer. All right, thanks for watching.